Good morning. Today we're doing the May June 2021 paper 22 extended. This is going to be brilliant. Question one: Probability. Uh, probability that Jane wins the game is seven tenths. Find the probability that Jane does not win the game. That's a pretty straightforward one minus seven over ten, which of course is three tenths. All right, she then plays 50 games, find the number of times she expected to win the game. So you really just need to do seven times five or multiply that 50 with a probability that would give you 35. Not 35 out of 50 because they don't want the answer as a probability, just 35, the number of times she wins. Question two, calculate the question. What you want to do is you want to put shift and find the root button that allows you to put any root in there. So I can put root four, then use the arrows and put in the rest of the digits. And there we get the answer, two fifths. Or if you want, you can write it as a decimal. Either one is correct. Question three, stem and leaf diagrams. Emma has 15 maths questions to complete. And that the diagram shows the time it took her to complete these questions. Over here, we got the quickest she was on a question was three minutes. And the longest it took was 20 minutes. And everything else is in between. Right. With that knowledge, let's complete the table. Mode, of course, means the most common value so the most time the most amount of times it took her to complete the question and looking at that there are three sixes next to each other here i have to be next to each other the values so that means it's not six minutes because the one there is part of the number so that means 16 minutes was the most common amount of time for her to complete it median means the middle right there's different ways of finding the middle one of them is using numbers so we are 15 values in the stem and stem and leaf diagram we need to add one to that and then divide it by two so 16 divided by two is eight so the eighth value is the middle value so let's count them from the beginning one two three four five six seven eight that is the eighth value not one but eleven we know it's correct because there are now one two three four five six seven values smaller than eleven and there is one two three four five six seven values bigger so that is definitely definitely the middle value last one the range okay is the largest value which in this case is 20 minus the lowest value which is 3 so the answer 17 minutes question 4 is quite confusing few candidates in the words of the examiner reports few candidates were able to get this right but to explain this let's use an example let's pick a value for k let's make it three start with three so let's say k equals three so that means we need to have three consecutive integers consecutive means one following the other integers whole number so we can pick any let's pick five six seven right the whole numbers they follow each other so what is the range of those numbers that would be the biggest minus the smallest which is five let me just write that nicely so the range would be two so let's look at look at this there are three consecutive integers and the range is two let's pick another one let's pick uh k as five so now we write down five consecutive integers anyway let's start at two so it's two three four five six what is the range of this one biggest is six smallest is two the range is four i think you might start to spot what is the pattern here let's just do one more to be sure 
let's pick K as two. Very straightforward example. K is two, so we have two consecutive integers. Let's do four and five, for example. Four and five. What is the range? There's only two numbers. The biggest is five, the smallest is four. The range is one. Okay, so now it's very pretty clear. Whatever k is, the range is one less. If k is three, the range is two. If k is five, the range is four. If k is two, the range is one. That means the expression, and an expression doesn't have an equal sign, is whatever the k is with one subtracted. Question five, scatter graphs, diagrams, graphs, and um, five eight definitely a controversial question. According to the examiner's report, very few candidates were able to get this one correct. Uh, it comes down to this, three data points is not enough to analyze any piece of data to get any viable result. So the correct answer here being, it is not possible to tell if there is a correlation as there's not enough points. If you thought it was uh, the next one, it shows a negative correlation, I don't blame you. Um, but we need to think carefully. So the correct answer there is the second one. Question 5b. This one was more straightforward, easier to get. First, line of best fit, obviously not correct because there's a large amount at the bottom above and below. B, clearly wrong. D, all the data points above the line. So the only possible correct answer here is C. Question six. Read this question carefully. It says a rhombus had size length of 6.5 centimeters. Remember, a rhombus is a square that's gone wonky, but all the sides are the same length and the opposite sides are parallel. Okay. Uh, it can be constructed by drawing two triangles. Use a ruler and compasses only. Construct the rhombus. Leave your construction arcs. That is important. And it says one diagonal of the rhombus has been drawn for you. Remember, a diagonal is what connects opposite corners. Right, so this is not the size of, of the rhombus. This is a diagonal. Okay, so we need to construct a triangle above and a triangle below that line. Now, the important thing here is that it is 6.5 centimeters the side. So we're gonna to have to open up the our compass exactly 6.5 centimeters. So we take our ruler and that would make sure it's exact open. So that distance there is 6.5 centimeters. Then we place the sharp end of the compass at one end of the compass of the line and we make a nice big arc doesn't have to be too dark okay secret is pressing hard here and light on the pencil so then you won't slip okay and we do the same on the other side of the line okay make a nice sweet arc and do the same there. Okay, this means now that the distance from the end of the line to where the two arcs cross, that should be exactly 6.5 centimeters because that's how wide we opened our compass. So when you draw these lines now, just do it as accurately as possible. That's one, two, see, that's exactly 6.5. Three and four. There we go. Perfect rhombus with construction arcs, which we do not rub out, and you'll get full marks. Question seven A, complete these statements. The reciprocal, remember, reciprocal is the inverse, it's what you multiply something by to make it one. So, meaning 0.2 as a fraction is 2 over 10 which if we simplify it 
is 1 over 5. Remember, reciprocal means we invert, we swap those around, which makes it 5 over 1, which is just 5. So reciprocal of 0 0.2 is 5. Right, a prime number between 90 and 100, right? A prime number only has two factors, the number itself and 1. For example, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, you know those, yeah? So let's see, it's not going to be an even number, because it can all be divided by 2. 2 is the only even prime number. So what comes to mind is 91. Let's see, 91, I can't divide it by 3, can't divide it by 5. Can we divide it by 7? Yes. 7 is a factor of 91, so that's not a prime number. 93 is just 3 more than 90. We can divide it by 3. It's not going to be 95. Can it be divided by 5? 97. That is probably it. Have a quick check. What can we divide 97 by? Can we divide it by 3? No. Can we divide it by 5? No. 7? No. 11? No. So that's it. It must be 97. Okay. From the list, write down the irrational number. Now, irrational number is a number with an infinite amount of random decimal places. Okay. So, if you do 7 divided by 5, the first one example, it's 1.4. It is terminating decimals, right? It stops. Square root of 9 is 3, but the square root of 7. If you were to type that in, gives you 2.64575, and it goes on forever, randomly. That makes it irrational. So the irrational number there, square root 7. Question 8, uh, you need to, we need to find B when A is 5.625 and C is 2. So let's do that substitution. Let uh, substitute the a for 5.625 and we've got a b square at the top and the c is 2. Right, so 5 times 2 obviously is 10. So we'll have b square over 10 equals to 5.625. Next thing, we multiply both sides by 10. So that means we multiply that by 10, which gives us 56.25 equals b squared. Okay. And then we need to get rid of the square, which means the square root. Okay. And there's one thing we remember here is um, that when we square root something, there is two answers. I mean, our calculator is only going to give us one answer. 56.25, 7.5, right? Because 7.5 squared is 56.25. But the fact of the matter is that negative 7.5 squared is also 56.25. That's why we put the plus and the minus. Because there's actually two answers but looking at the mark scheme in fact that is not that important in this case they gave marks for just 7.5 but to be safe put in that plus and the minus question 9 without using a calculator work out two thirds divided by one and three sevenths now without using a calculator means if you're going to do this you type it in two thirds divided by shift so we can put a mixed fraction three over seven. We get the answer seven fifteen. Okay, I've got the right answer. I'm gonna get zero marks because this is blank. The instruction says show all your working, give your answers a fraction in the simplest form. Okay, so we need to show all our working out. First thing we need to do is when you take this mixed fraction and change it to an improper fraction. Now that is 1 times 7. 7 plus 3 is 10. So that's 10 over 7. If you ever do 
get confused or you forget or you want to save your brain power you can put it into your calculator and your calculator will do it for you okay next is the invert and multiply so we invert the second fraction and we multiply or you multiply across all right so that will be 2 times 7 is 14 3 times 10 is 30 and of course if we simplify that by dividing the top and the bottom by 2 we get 7 over 15 now that we've shown every step we can get full marks right in the mark scheme 10 over 17 showing that gives you a mark showing that you're multiplying or multiplying across the method is another mark and then once you have those two marks they'll give you a mark for having the final correct simplified answer question 10 standard form write 0 0.00654 in standard form remember standard form is where we have a number between 1 and 10 and then we got times 10 and the power so here we need to move the decimal point three spaces to make this a number between 1 and 10 so that will give us 6.54 and since we move the three spaces to the right it will be negative 3 right quickly for the future you can change your calculator settings to help you with this so uh, if you press sh shift setup number format if you've got a different type of calculator you should be able to find this as well number format we want to change that we want to change it from normal to scientific notations you press 2 then we need to select a number between 0 and 9 uh, we was usually, usually want three significant figures but putting four is just a bit safer okay that means now if we put in a number into our calculator and we press equal it gives the answer in standard form there we go to four significant figures in this case of course i pressed the four okay that helps a lot especially if you have to do calculations in standard form if you want to switch it back you just press shift set up number format we want normal so we press three and then you select the one or the two i think two is a better option now it gives you the answer in normal format Question 10b, this is more of a thinking question rather than using your calculator. The number 1.467 times 10 to the power of 102, massive number, is written as an ordinary number. Write down the number of zeros that follow the digit. So we need to recognize here that we're going to have to move that decimal point 102 spaces to the right. But the first three spaces, there'll be numbers. So once we move the three spaces, we're going to have to fill the rest with zeros. So 102 minus 3 is 99. 99 zeros we'll have to put at the end. Question 11, right? The best thing to do here is use the method that you have been taught. Also good to notice that there are dots above the 0 and the 4. So 0 0.04 recurring means 0, 4, 0, 4, 0, 4, and not Zero point zero four four four, like if there was only a dot above the four. Okay, the method we were learned is to set this equal to x. So we put x equals zero point zero four recurring. Because we got two digits recurring, we need to multiply it by a hundred and do the same over there. That will give us a hundred x equals. Well, zero four point zero four recurring let's write the first equation again okay so now it's important that our decimals line up so line up the decimal points and see that the zero and the zero line up and the four and the four now we can subtract that gives us 99x equals four Okay, last thing left to do is to divide the 99, so we get 4 over 99. Let's check if that's correct. 4 
over 99 gives us 0 0.04 occurring where the two dots where it should be. Okay, I think if you press SD again, you see what it looks like as a normal number. Okay, so yeah, we got the right answer. Question 12, sets of Venn diagrams. Oh, this is going to be fun. Right, first, the universal set is integers greater than 2. So all whole numbers greater than 2. So going from 2 upwards, yeah? So in this rectangle here, part 2, everything is bigger than 2. Right, set A is prime numbers. Now, prime numbers start at 2. But since our universal set is integers greater than 2, we don't start at 2 in this case. We start at 3. So that would be 3. What's the next prime number? 5, 7, 11, etc. And it continues. Okay. Odd numbers, you know them. 1, 3, 5, S. And then square numbers. First square number is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. But again, we are starting with integers greater than 2. So then it will be 2 times 4. 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 4 is 16, 25, etc. It's good to see the actual numbers to see what we're dealing with here. Right, 12a part 1. Describe the type of numbers in this set. Complement of B, intersect with C, right? Describe. If you can't write down the actual numbers. So let's see. The complement of B. B is the odd numbers. So the opposite of that is even numbers. So we can write this. So it will be even. Okay, the intersection that n means it has to be the one and the other one, both, right? And then c is square numbers, so that means simply we write down square numbers, so even square numbers. That is what they are describing with that. Question 12a part two. Complete the set labels on the Venn diagram. So here we got a subset. A set within a set. So let's see which one of these sets fits into the other ones. Okay. Uh, if you look carefully, the square numbers is quite unique by themselves. They got odd and even numbers, right? Odd numbers is actually a very big group, half of all known numbers. So the prime numbers is a smaller group, and they are all odd, except for two, which is not included. All prime numbers are odd, so A would fit inside all the odd numbers, since we don't have two. Okay, and that only leaves, yeah, this one C, the overlap there would be the odd square numbers, which is every second square number, 925 would go in there. All right. Question 12B. Now this is a challenging question. Very few candidates get this right. Okay, but you can do it. Okay, let's follow a method here. Let's start inside the brackets because bitmaps we always do brackets first, and we simply start with the first set inside the brackets. That's E, and let's shade it. Okay, you're going to use a pencil in the exam, and then you can rub things out. So we're going to shade that. Okay. And use different colors if you want. Then I'm just going to go and I'm going to shade F. Okay. Simply start from the beginning. That's it. We've got E and F. Now I'm going to think carefully. What does that N mean? That means intersect. It means the requirement is that what I'm looking for is in both sets. Not the one or the other one. It has to be both. So that means... That in the end, we take a rubber and we only leave the part where they overlap. And that's the middle part. So I rub out everything else. Uh, yeah. So in the end, I'm going to be left with only the part where they overlap. Okay. That is what's going on inside the bracket. Okay. Now, looking at our bracket, something else is going on there. That's a complement. The complement means exactly the opposite of what I've just done. So what I need to do now is I need to rub out what I've done and shade exactly the opposite. So I'm going to use lines here. Okay, so everything shaded 
that is exactly the opposite to everything except that little eye there right so now we've dealt with the bracket now let's go to the rest that is d d over there is the set d but with a complement it means we need to shade exactly the opposite of that everything that is not d so i'm going to draw a few lines everything that is not d needs to get shaded okay which includes part over here of the one that was left unshaded now that we've done that we look at the sign union what does union mean union means in the one or the other one or both so when you see the union sign you don't shade anything you leave it the way it is and that is my answer everything shaded except the middle part okay to make it very clear so you see what that means okay is it looks like this all right so everything outside d needs to be shaded is the complement of d and because that is in union we leave it then also e intersect with f the complement of that means if it's not in e and in f then he needs to be shaded all right this takes a bit of practice to get right but you can do it question 13 clearly is circle theorems look at every piece of information slowly and thoroughly and you'll get this right it tells us a b c are points on a circle center oh whenever they give you the center it might not be relevant here but i always mark the radiuses remember they are the same length so that's a radius that's a radius they are the same length right da and dc are tangents the moment you see tangents think about the angle between a tangent and a radius okay we got a radius we got a tangent so that means this is 90 degrees and the angle there is 90 degrees angle adc is 44 degrees work out x right so let's start with what we got we clearly have a kite there and in the, the kite a d c o and in the kite uh we got the two 90 degree angles which means i got three out of the four angles in that kite any quadrilateral adds up to yes 360 degrees so if i want to find angle a o c which is the angle at the middle there let's mark it clearly a o c okay i need to do 360 minus the 290 degree angles to give us 180 and the 44 okay so what's that that will be 180 minus 4436 degrees okay also a good idea to mark it on the diagram there okay so they need to know what we're all about right which part haven't we used we haven't used a o c b right immediately there again i see i got an angle at the center of the circle and an angle on the circumference at b so what comes to mind is the circle theorem of the angle at the center of a circle is twice the angle of the, at the circumference meaning our next step would be simply to divide 136 by 2 okay which would give us 68 degrees and a quick look at the mark scheme tells me that that is correct okay excellent we don't have to give any reasons doesn't ask us to do that make sure you show what you're working out question 14 there is many ways to attempt this question uh, in the mark scheme they want uh, they showed the method of using 
the formula for the area of a trapezium, which is half AB times the perpendicular height. Okay, but I'm going to do the method that most students in the exam did it by, and that was dividing the shape into a rectangle and two triangles. Okay, now working out the area of the rectangle is quite straightforward. That's 15.4 times 18.2. Right, it gives us 280.28. So we got the area there. Now the area of the triangle, okay, is a little bit different here because we don't have enough information. What we need for the area of a triangle is half base times perpendicular height. Okay, so what we want to work out here is the base there. Okay, now. Recognizing we got a right angle triangle, trigonometry, we either use Pythagoras or Sokatua, but in this case, since we got angles involved, we need to use Sokatua. Right, so what do we have? We got the angle. We want to know the base of this triangle, which is right next to the angle, so that's the adjacent, and there is the opposite. The longest side over there being the hypotenuse, but we're using the opposite and we want to know the adjacent, which means we need to use the last part of our done ratio our, our trigonometry ratios here, which is ton. So we write down tangent 62 equals the O is first, so we write the opposite first, which is 18.2 over what we want to know the adjacent. Let's label that x. Okay, we want to work out what x is, so we need to get rid of that fraction, which means we've got to multiply the x on that side and divide the tan ratio here, which will look in the end like this. x equals, give ourselves some more space, 18 over 2 over tan 62. Not tan to the power of minus 1, as we're moving it with the angle. All right, so calculating that will be 18.2 over tangent of 62. Uh, gives us this massive answer. Okay, remember now, don't round your answers yet. So let's use a fair bit of decimal values there. Okay. Right, that means we got x, we got this distance here, we can now work out the area of the triangle. So the area of the triangle, let's squeeze it in here, is half base times height. Half the base is what we just got. And the height being 18.2. Okay. We still got that in our calculator, let's leave it there, times it by 18.2, times it by a half, if you want to, because now, let's write it down, 88.0617, but since there are two triangles, the one over here and the one right, we're going to multiply it by two again, so we're back where we started, okay, so, the final calculation is to add the area of the rectangle and the two triangles. So again, so it's 2 times 88.0617 plus 280.28. I've already got the first plot. Add the 280.28. And that gives us the answer. 4, 5, 6. Point four zero three, etc. Rounded to three significant figures, four hundred and fifty six. Right, like I said, 
you could have used the area of the trapezium, like in the mark scheme, but this is the method most students used in the exam, and it was successful. Question 15, congruence. This is a topic that is often neglected by students when they're studying. All right. First example here is pretty clear. We have a angle here, 60 degrees, which is the same over there. We've got a side and a side, and we've got another angle, another angle, which is the same, hence it's congruent, and the reason angle, side, angle. That's what they want you to do. Okay. So, in the first one here, we need to do, let's look carefully. We have a side here that is equal to a side there. We've got the angle 35 and the angle 35. And we got another side there and a side there. So is this congru congruent? Yes, it is. Congruent. And the reason is side, angle, side. Do note here, lots of candidates lost marks because they write this in the wrong order. You can't write as... The order is important. You can't try it side, side, all right? It needs to be S, A, S. Okay, next one. Let's have a quick look. We got a side that is 4.5 and another side that is 4.5. We got a side that is 4 and a side that is 4. And we got a side that is 5 and a side that is 5. Is S, S, S. Side, 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 does it give us congruence? Yes, it does. If all the sides are the same length, then it is congruent. Okay, okay, of course the order doesn't matter. Okay, last one, let's have a look. Well, good, we got a side there, and a side there. Okay, or rather, if you have studied, we got the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse, and we got a right angle here and a right angle there. So what lots of students said, oh, this must be the RHS, right angle, hypotenuse side, congruence, but we need to look more carefully. We got a 65 degrees there and a 35 degrees there. It's not the same, but it doesn't mean it's not congruent. We need to look at the other angle. Now, if we get in the first triangle, 35 degrees, it means the angle over there is 55, okay? Whereas the other one, second triangle got 65 there, then that other triangle needs to be, what is it, 15? 25, 25. So we deal all the angles are not the same, okay? This means this is not congruent okay since we got angles that are different so there is no reason to get because it's not congruent okay study your congruence get full marks question 16 coordinate geometry it is uh, the first question there they want us to find the length between two coordinate points let's have a look what that looks like so there's the two points, 5, 7, 9, minus 1. Uh, we can connect them with a line. Connect them with a line. There we go. We need to find the length of that line. All right. What we actually have here is we can connect that and make it a right angle triangle like this and uh, like that. Now, in this right angle triangle, we need to find the length of this line. Uh, the height, that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Or we can simply subtract the two uh, y values. So 7 minus minus 1 equals 8. And we need to find the base of this triangle, which is clearly 4. Or if we can't count it, we subtract the two x values, which is 9 minus 5 equals 4. And then we use Pythagoras. What does this look like if you don't have a fancy diagram? Okay, you can't count squares. You use this formula, right? As you see, we're going to use Pythagoras. Then we have to 
subtract the two x values from each other, square it because it's Pythagoras, then subtract the two y values from each other, square it because it's Pythagoras. Okay, the first thing we do is we label our x values, x1 and x2, and the y values, y1, y2, and we then put it into the formula. So this is 9 minus 5 squared, and y2 is minus 1, minus 7 squared. Okay, so that is almost what we did here. You just see I've swapped the y values around, but that doesn't matter because then when we subtract it, 9 minus 4 is 4 squared plus minus 7 minus 1. I know it's minus 8 squared but once we square it that minus doesn't matter just remember you need to square the minus as well you need to be inside the brackets okay so save time grab your calculator hammer it in there okay just remember that if you got a negative well you can actually just leave it out but if you're going to square it make sure it's inside the brackets and then you'll get 8.944 etc Rounded the three significant figures 8.94. Right, question B find the equation of line AB. Let's go back to our line. Okay, let's get rid of some of the clutter. Go. Things are very similar here. We've got most of the information we need to find the equation. Because the first thing we need to do is find the gradient. Gradient. Remember. Oh my goodness. Okay, to find the equation, we need to do y equals mx plus c. That m value, that is the gradient, which is the change in y over the change in x. Difference in y, difference in x. And we already can see it here, what you've done before. It's 8 over 4, so the gradient is 2. Again, if you don't have a diagram, you can use the formula, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay. Our two coordinates being minus 1, minus 7. And x2 is 9 minus 5, which gives us negative 8 over 4, which I haven't mentioned before. As the line is going down from left to right, is a negative gradient minus 2. Okay, so that means our equation, you have to write an equation, so you need to start with y equal. Don't leave the y equal out. It's an equation, you're going to lose mark. The m value, the gradient is minus 2, x. What's left now is to find the C value. Okay, if we continue this line that way, somewhere up there, it's going to cross the y-axis. We can't see it on our diagram. We're going to have to work this out. Okay, but we have information so far. We've got y equals minus 2x. Now we need to find the C, so plus C. All right, we got an x and a y. In fact, we got two. We got there an x and a y, and there an x and a y. We can substitute it into our formula to work out c. Let's use the positive numbers, which makes it a bit easier. So the y is 7. Substitute y for 7. Minus 2. x is 5. Okay. So that gives us 7 equals minus 2 times 5 is minus 10. Add the 10 on the other side. So we get c equals 17. Okay. And that is the correct answer. Question 17. We're still doing coordinate geometry. And it wants to find the gradient of a line that is perpendicular to the line 3y equals 4x minus 5. Now, if we can write that equation in the standard form of y equals mx plus c, we can find the gradient there, which is the m value. So what we need to do here is we need to divide both sides by 3 to get rid of that 3. So that means we'll have to be left with y equals 
4x minus 5 divided by 3. Still doesn't look quite like we want there, but we could also divide each term here separately. So that will give us 4 over 3x minus 5 over 3. Now, I've got that graph here. There we go. The green line here is this graph. Okay, as you can see, it crosses the y axis at negative uh, 1.6 recurring, 1 and 2 thirds, and it's got a gradient of 4 over 3. So if we were to draw a we were to draw a right angle triangle here you see it's got the run the rise of four over the run gradient is four over three okay also here i've got a random just random perpendicular line 90 degree angle so what do we notice from this angle first of all the direction has changed where this has got a positive gradient this one's got a negative. So if we want to find the gradient of a perpendicular line, we have to change the sign. Okay, and what does the gradient show us? If I draw my right angle triangle here now, the rise is 3 and the run is 4. So that has swapped around. So that's, if you can memorize that, when you have a gradient of 4 over 3, for a perpendicular line, you change the positive gradient to a negative, and you swap or invert the fraction, and that will give you the gradient of the perpendicular line. Question 18, functions. This is going to be good. Right, let's start here. It says solve, and it looks complicated. Let's start with it. The function of f. Let's write it down. The function of f is x squared minus 25 then the function of g needs to go into the function of f so instead of that little x there we need to write the function of g which is x plus 4 okay now remember all of that needs to be squared because it was x squared okay then again also instead of x we now have an x plus 1. So again, here where it says x, we need to change that for an x plus 1. Okay, so instead of x, we put x plus 1. So that's what the left-hand side now looks like. Then we got equal. Then we got the function of g, which is x plus 4. I'm leaving lots of space because now instead of x, we need to do x the function of f so we just put the function of f into g remove that x and write x squared minus 25 okay great now we have sorted the first part now we need to start simplifying things first in this bracket we can simplify we can add the one and the four that will give us x plus five squared minus 25 and over here we can add to minus 25 4 which gives us minus 21 right now remember x plus 5 squared doesn't mean x squared 5 squared it means we've got two brackets x plus 5 x plus 5 which needs to be multiplied with each other we've got a minus 24 hanging around at the back and on this side the x squared minus 21 is going to have to wait as well Okay, multiplying out the brackets, x times x is x squared, x times 5 is 5x, five, 5 times x is 5x, and 5 times 5 is positive 25. We can now drop the brackets, because we have eliminated them. So we can simplify this. Uh, we got the x squared, 5x plus 5x is 10x. And 25 minus 25 leaves us nothing. Okay. Next thing I would do, I would see if we subtract x squared from both sides. Remember what we do on the left, we need to do on the right. 
we can eliminate the x squared or subtract the x squared on the left hand side, move it over. That leaves us with 10x equals negative 21. Last thing we have to do is to divide that negative 21 by 10. Negative 21 divided by 10 gives us a beautiful correct answer of negative 2.1. Okay, well done. Question 19a, again, pay attention to every little piece of information. The diagram shows a shape made from an equilateral triangle. Let's just process this information first. Equilateral means, of course, all the sides are the same length. It also means all the angles are 60 degrees. Okay, that is important. And ABC is a sector of a circle. So we can see ABC that it talks about the major sector going around the top. The points B and C lie on the circle. We can see that, center A. The side length of the equilateral triangle is 12.4. So each side is 12.4 centimeters. Work out the perimeter. Now remember, perimeter means the outside, everything. So let's start here with this massive arc going around. Okay. If you remember, that is part of a circle, circumference. The formula for that is pi d or 2 pi r. Okay, because they've given us the radius, which is 12.4, because it's equilateral triangle, we're going to use the second one here. So, yeah, we're going to use 2 pi r, and we're working out an arc length. Right, now this is not the whole circle, this is only the part of a circle, okay? How much of the circle? We need to find out how much, what fraction of the circle that is, and multiply it. So a whole circle, of course, is 360 degrees. Uh, what is that angle there? Let's have a look. Okay, so we got 2 pi, the radius is 12.4 times this reflex angle there, of course, is 360 minus that 60, 300 degrees. So we've got 300 degrees out of 360 degrees. That's the fraction of the arc we need. So let's slot that in. Our calculator and then we got the answer 64.92624817 we can write that down just don't round it or you want to be more accurate write down the answer in terms of pi okay that will be the most accurate answer to write down great so we got that massive arc there but do we have the whole perimeter no because the perimeter goes all the way around every piece of the outside line. So what do we need to do? We need to add just this part, BC, to that answer. So 64, 62 over 3 pi plus 12.4. We still got that on our calculator. We add 12.4. And this time we can write down the answer, 77.326. Etc. Rounded the three significant figures 77.3. Question 19b again, look at all the information very carefully. The diagram shows two sectors of a circle. The major sector, okay, that's what the major sector means. The biggest sector, the shaded part, uh, is shaded. The area of that major sector is 74.5. So 74.5 centimeter square that's what we're referring to so, right so how do we work out the area of a major sector so remember we're talking about area here area of a circle pi r squared right so the area of a sector the formula for that will be pi r squared but then we need to again like the previous question work out the fraction so we need to take that angle whatever the angle is, divided by 360. So what do we have in this formula? 
Well, we got the area of the sector. That's 74.5 by k. Radius, do we have it? No, that's what they want us to calculate. So we leave it at that. All right. Then the angle. Now that would not be 41. That is the angle inside the major sector, of course, which will be 360 minus 41, which is 319 over 360. Okay. And there we go. Now we just need to solve this to find the answer. Okay, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to divide the 390 over 316 on both sides, or rather divide it on this side. 37.5 divided by 390 over 360 will give me pi r squared. Okay, so here we go. 74.5 divided by 390. Oh, forgot it. Just give me a sec. Let's use the fraction button. Okay, now we get this massive, massive, massive answer. So for now, I'm going to leave it like that. Next part would be to divide the pi on both sides. Okay, so let's do that. Divide that by pi. And again, we've got this amazing, massive answer. Let's write that down 26 point. 761 etc equals r squared and then of course we need to square root that to find the answer so i got a very accurate answer they don't round it what we can do now is we can simply do square root press answer it inserts the previous answer press equal and we got an answer for r which is 5.17 three, one, etc. rounded the three significant figures, 5.17. Okay, it's very important not to round your answers prematurely, okay? Which means before you get to the end. Try to keep it on the calculator or write, at least write lots of digits because lots of students lose marks when they're round before the end of the question, which means the answer is not accurate enough and I lose marks. Question 20, we're going to have some fun with algebra. We've got three brackets we need to expand. Let's start by expanding just the first two brackets. So we do x times x is 2x squared. Let's keep that in a bracket. Then x times 5 is plus 5x. Minus 2 times 2x is minus 4x. And minus 2 times 5 is minus 10. Go through this slowly, make sure you get every sign correct and don't lose the trailer hanging at the back, x plus 3. Okay, our next step would be to correctly simplify this middle term. So we got 2x squared, 5 minus 4 is 1. So it's plus 1x or just plus x minus 10. And we still got the x plus 3. Okay. Change my color slightly now. Right now, we need to expand this three term bracket and the two term bracket. So, we need to multiply each term in the first bracket with each term in the second one. So, let's get started. First, we're going to do 2x squared times x is 2x cubed. 2x squared times 3 is 6x squared. Second term here, x times x is positive x squared and x times 3 is 3x again let's have a slight change in color last one minus 10 times x is minus 10x and minus 10 times 3 is minus 30. now what we need to do is collect all the like terms first one 2x cubed, there is no other term with a cube, so that stays the same. We've got two terms with an x squared, 6x squared plus 1x squared will give us 7x squared. And then we got 3x minus 10x 
So 3 minus 10, of course, being minus 7x. And hanging at the back there, waiting patiently, we got the minus 30. Okay, and that's it. Okay, just, just write the answer on the line. If you do this slowly and patiently, you can get it right. Question 21, we've got to do with inverse proportionality. Let's start, go slowly. I wish my dog would be quiet. Sit up. Right. The force of attraction F newtons between two magnets is inversely proportional. All right. So we start with F. We are doing proportion. Let's put the proportion sign. When it's inverse proportion, we need to put it as a denominator. So inversely proportional to the square. So square is going to be up there of the distance d. Okay. And we put it a one there between the mag magnets. That's what it looks like in mathematical language. That whole first sentence there. F is proportionate inversely to the square of d. Now we can turn this into an equation by putting in the constant k at the top there. Okay, now we now have an equation we can use. Our next step would be to find that constant k. Okay, and we do that by substituting the values they have given us into our equation. So f is 48, that's equal to k over d is 1.5 squared. All looks good at this moment. Right, uh, we can now square that 1.5. 1.5 squared is 2.25, of course. And then multiply both sides by 2.25. And that will give us our constant. Okay. 108. So now what we need to do is we need to take our equation, which is already started right in here, f equals with k being 108 and that being over d squared. Question 21b. Uh, this question baffled quite a few students in the exam and lots of students left it blank, I have to be honest. I had to think twice as well about this one right students that got this question right though they try to put some numerical values in there all right so let's see what we have we got from a we got this equation f equals 108 over d squared okay we also know that uh the information that gave us there when d is 1.5 f is 48 so meaning okay if D is 1.5, then F is 48. Okay. So let, like, let's, let's write that down, right? So if D is 1.5, then F is 48. Okay, now what they tried to say in this sentence here, that if you double, the distance, which d, then what happens to f? It gets changed by another factor n. We want to know what that is. So let's let's try this. Let's let's double d. Let's make 1.5 doubled is 3, and see what is f. So we're going to do this equation again. The only difference now is we are making d double. So we got 3 squared. Let's work that out. So 108. Divided by 3 squared is 9, it's 12. Okay. So, how do we get from 48 to 12? Okay. We, what, we divided it by 4. So, if we double this, we divide that by 4. Let's see if it continues. Let's double it again. Let's make that 6. Let's see. So, 
we should get 3 here if it's correct. So let's go back into the equation and we've got 108 and we're now going to divide it by 6 squared. 108 divided by 6 squared. Bam! It's 3. So that factor that we is division by 4. How are we going to write down? We can't write divide by 4. How do we divide by something by 4? When we divide something by 4, we work out what is a quarter of that. And that's the answer. One quarter. You can figure it out. You're smart enough. Question 22. Some more fun with algebra. Right. Simplifying means we need to be cancelling uh, factors here. And, of course, you can't cancel x squared and x squared and 12 and 12. Please don't do that. You can't cancel when there are negatives or positives, or pluses or minus. We need to factorize first. So looking at this, um, looking at denominator, that one looks like it's going to be a little bit easier to factorize. Okay. Let's look at common factors of 3x squared and 12x. So what pops out there is the 3. We can divide 3 by 3, and we can divide 12 by 3. Okay, but there's also an x in both terms. So we can factorize out a 3x. That will leave us with an x uh, minus 4. Okay, always always check if you've got it right. Yeah? If we multiply 3x, x minus 4. If we multiply it out, we get 3x squared. 3x times minus 4 is minus 12x. Yes, that's correctly factorized. The top. The numerator is going to be a little bit harder, okay? If you want to use the quadratic formula to try and find these factors, you can, but you need to practice that. But I think there's a quicker way, okay? We know we're going to have to multiply 2x and x to get 2x squared. 99.999% of the time, there's going to be a bracket in the numerator and the denominator that is the same that will be cancelled out. So if we've got an x minus 4 below the line, probably going to need an x minus 4 above the line. Okay, that makes things a lot easier. Okay, so remember, because we need to multiply the last two terms, okay, meaning this term here and this term here, multiply them together to get that, no, 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 I won't do that. Okay, multiply that minus 12x. That's what I want, okay. That minus 12. So something times minus 4 needs to give us minus 12. That's what I'm trying to say here. And of course, that something going to be 3. Positive 3. So that means this is a positive 3. That could be our answer for factorizing. But of course, please just don't take your, my word for it or trust yourself. Okay. Too much. Check. 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times minus 4 is minus 8x. 3 times x is 3x. 3 times minus 4 is minus 12. Okay. Simplifying the middle two terms, minus 8 plus 3 will give me minus 5 minus 12. That is correct. That's what we wanted. Okay. So all is looking good at this moment. We can now cancel the x minus 4 and the x minus 4. So we're left with 2x plus 3 over 3x. Okay. And that is the correct final answer. Well done. Question 23. Let's solve this sine equation. We got 4 sin x equals 3. So first we divide both sides by 4. That gives us sin x equals 3 quarters. Then we move the sin to the other side. So it's sin to the power of minus 1 over 3 quarters. And we slot that into our calculator. So we put shift, shift sin. Uh, so it's sin to the power of minus 1, fraction 3 quarters, side arrow. There we go. And we got the answer. 48.590, etc. Rounded to three significant figures gives us x equals 48.6. Right, we've got one answer, but yes, that says find all the solutions. So there's more to this than just that. 
Let's look at that sine graph. Okay, there it is. Okay, now what we've worked out now is the first answer. So we know that if we go from 48.6 degrees, which is just above 45, and to the side, we get three quarters, 0 0.75. But there's another solution. If we continue to the right from 0 0.75, we will get another answer there. Okay, so let's just make that clear. Over here, we got three quarters or 0 0.75. If we go across and down, we'll get the first answer here, 48.6. But we have another answer over there, which need to figure out. Okay, how to get that answer? Okay, we need to look at this distance. This distance from 0 to 48.6, because this graph is symmetrical, would be the same distance as this from 180 to where our answer lies. That distance will also be 48.6. What does this mean? I mean, to get the other answer, we need to subtract it from 180. So we need to do 100, 180 minus, okay, and it's better to use your unrounded answer here, 48.59, etc. So let's do that, 180 minus 48, no, just put the previous answer in there, which gives us 131.409, etc. Okay, so we need to write that down. So we need to put here and x equals 131.409. Oh, no, three significant figures. 131.4 is good enough. Okay, we can check if that's correct. All we need to do is take our original equation for sin and in there put this 131.4. Let's put it in there. Okay. No, I've now rounded my answer, so it's not going to be exact, but we put it in there. We should get something close to three. And yes, I get 3.0000. Okay, so it's correct. I know it's correct. You can do that by trial and error. Students in the exam that got this right is students that draw themselves a quick uh, sign graph and they could figure it out from there. That was the most successful student. Question 24, some more fun with algebra. All right, now we got algebraic fractions. So let's just quickly remind us ourselves what we do when we add in fractions. Let's do a basic example here. Let's say I'm adding two thirds to three quarters. Okay, the first step here would to get the denominators the same. One way of doing that is multiplying them together. That will give us 12. Then do equivalent fractions because we multiplied 3 by 4. We need to multiply the 2 by 4. That will give us 8. And because we multiply the 4 by 3, we need to multiply that 3 by 3. That gives us 9. And it gives us an answer of 17 over 12. All right, so that's what we're doing with basic fractions. It's called the smiley face method. We got a little smiley face there. Okay. We're going to do the same with our algebraic fractions on the left. So let's do that. Let's start first of all. We multiply the two denominators together, and that will give us x plus 1 times x plus 9. We do not have to expand these brackets. In fact, it's better to leave it that way because later on we might be able to simplify it. Okay. Then above, we need to do 1 times x plus 9. So 1 times x plus 9 will stay x plus 9. We don't need to put that in brackets. Okay, then there is a plus there. You see that? There's a plus. So we put the plus in. And then we do x plus 1 times 9. Now everything here needs to be multiplied together. So now we have to put a bracket. Because our next step would be to expand that bracket. So we got x plus 9 at the top. 9 times x is 9x. And 9 times 1 is 9, not 1. That was a very common mistake in the exam. All right. Don't lose anything else. Now we can simplify that. x plus x is 10x. And 9 plus 9 is 18. And down here, we got this. Okay. Right. 
Now, let's get rid of fraction. Fractions is a way of solving this equation. So we want to get that whole denominator, get rid of it. So we multiply that on both sides or multiply it on the other side. So from here, it would look like this. 10x plus 18 equals all of this will be multiplied over there. x plus 1, x plus 9. Right. Now, in this case, it seems we're going to have to expand those brackets. So that gives us 10x plus 18. x times x is x squared. x times 9 is 9x. 1 times x is 1x, or just x. 1 times 9 is 9. Then we got x squared. 9x plus 9. 9x plus 1x is 10x. And there's the 9 at the end. All right. We have to solve this. Solve meaning where would this quadratic equation cross the x-axis? To do that, we need to set everything equal to 0. So we need to move everything to one side. It's going to be easier to get everything on the right-hand side. So we're going to subtract 10x. We're going to subtract the 18. Subtract the 10x, subtract the 18 from this side here. So it's going to look like this. x squared plus 10x plus 9 minus 10x minus 18. All right. Let's simplify that. 10x minus 10x is 0. And then 9 minus 18 gives us a negative 9. Okay. It is looking beautiful. Okay. x squared minus 9 is very easy to factorize because they're both square numbers and there's a minus in the middle. So that makes it an x plus 3 and an x minus 3. Okay, remember, because when we multiply out x plus 3 and x minus 3, that will give us x squared minus 3x plus 3x minus 9. These two middle terms will cancel out, and we're back where we wanted that. So we can split it up into x plus 3 equals 0 and x minus 3 equals 0. That means x is a negative 3, now x is a 3. And when things work out this beautifully, you know you must have it correct. Just go at it slowly. Make sure you don't make any mistakes with the signs, the minus and the pluses.